Amen. Praise God. All right. Well, we're going to finally kind of kick off this series uh, um, on the pursuit of holiness. And there's a few things in my introduction that I want to debunk first and foremost. Number one, holiness is not about morality. It's about relationship. Holiness is not about morality. It's about relationship. I've always been taught that holiness was about my clothes and about the way I talked and the way I dressed and what I didn't do or what I did do. Touch not, taste not, handle not. That's what I was always taught. But, 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 but as I have dived into this study, <clears throat> what I learned about holiness is that holiness or the process of sanctification, which is the process of making you holy, is about your relationship with God. That as you progressively, continually seek after God and walk with him, he is changing you and transforming you and molding you and shaping you and setting you apart for his purpose and his plan for your life. That's what true holiness is. That's what it means to be holy. That's what it means to be set apart. And so it's not about the things that you do. It's about the relationship that you have with God that then influences how you live. Behavior can be altered without relationship. People can go through a 12-step program and stop drinking. They do it all the time. I watch intervention. Yes. Yes. I watch shows like that. And they take them away for three months and get them clean. And they come back and, yeah, I've been clean for 10 years. And no Jesus, no Holy Spirit, no nothing. So you can fix behavior, but you can't fix heart. You can't fix soul. You can't transform the image and the embodiment of Christ. You can't manufacture that. That's something that only comes through time and relationship. And see, too many people are leaving out the relationship and just trying to fix behavior. And they're finding out that I don't have to be in relationship to stop doing certain things. And so what they do is they start focusing on being this good person, but not being a godly person. Because there's good people all over the place according to their own interpretation of good, Pastor Joe. They'll base their good off of what I don't do. Not off of who I'm in relationship with. My good is based upon Jesus Christ. And he's the one molding me and shaping me through this process. And so if you'll go with me in your Bibles to a very familiar scripture that's going to, I'm going to use as our jump off point, Romans chapter eight, verses 28 through 30. Romans chapter eight, verses 28 through 30. And I'm going to follow Bianca's lead. And I'm going to ask you to stand again and read the word with me. And then we're going to pray and dive into this. So once you have it, jump on your feet in reverence of the word, not of me. In the reverence of of the word, not of me. When you have it, shout amen. If you don't have it, say, hold on. Now y'all with electronics, y'all better. You got people with the actual Bible beating you. <laughs> amen. Scripture says in Romans chapter eight, verse 28 through 30, he says, and we know all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. For he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called, also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So, Father, we just thank you for your word. We pray, God, that you would give clarity and understanding that, God, today we would instruct and impart 
uh, into the listeners, the knowledge of the word that will lead to transformation in their life. Lord, I pray that they not just be hearers of the word, but doers as well. And so God, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus name. Amen and amen. In verse 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. When we're talking about the pursuit of holiness, what we're talking about is a progression that happens and that progression starts with the relationship and that comes through a call that God literally calls his people out of darkness into light. He calls them by the clarion call of salvation, the gospel. When the gospel message goes out, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God. Not it produces the power of God or it's a part of the power of God. He said, it is. It is the dunamis. It is the might. It is the strength and the ability of God to save just by the gospel. So the gospel is the call. And when we hear the call and we answer the call, we, we must understand that we're being called according to his purpose. We're not being called into our own purpose we're being called according to his purpose. And his purpose is for us to be saved and conformed to the image of his son. That, 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 that this verse ha has not been properly broken down for us to understand so that we can see the process of sanctification in this very familiar verse that he calls us out to conform us into the image of his son that this is a process, and this is the process of sancti sanctification. Hagismos, for those that are looking this up in the strong, is number 38, and this is the process of advancing in holiness. It is used of believers being progressively transformed by the Lord into his likeness or similar nature. This is what consecrates us, what purifies us, this affects our entire heart and then our life. That's why the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart, if you affirm that he is the Lord and you devote yourself from your heart, then you are one of those who love him. Ah, and see, to love him is to vote, is to devote yourself to him. Not to just say words out of your mouth with no backing, with, with no action behind it. That would be a hearer, but not a doer of the word. And so God is calling for a people, and this term call is kaleo, and it metaphorically means to invite someone to something, to participate in it and enjoy it. He's literally calling you and inviting you into his kingdom to participate in his purpose and enjoy relationship with him. Oh, we're just getting started. Sanctification is ultimately the work of God. However, it involves your commitment to living the new life that you've been given through Jesus Christ. We have the responsibility of setting ourselves apart and then God makes us more and more like him. So there's a partnership, there's a participation going on that you actually have to join this. This is not you just saying something and you walking away and living and hoping that God will do something. No, you actually have to set yourself apart. And then he begins to work in you both the will and to do his good pleasure. That's called working out your soul salvation with fear and trembling. Because uh, you've got to position yourself. This is not just going to happen. This is something that is going to be a partnership between you and God. As we obey God's directions, we begin to grow 
a deeper affection for his ways and we lose our desire for sin over time. As we obey God's direction, we begin to grow a deeper affection for God's ways and we lose our desire for sin over time. It's like this. If you hang around with God long enough, you're going to begin to talk like him, walk like him. You're going to begin to think like him. You're going to begin to see things his way. What happens is that most people leave God at the church house and they don't bring him home to their house. On Sunday, I'm holy. I'm, 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 I'm saved, Mama Hill, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, and fire baptized. But on Monday, <laughs> I got the I can't help it. On Tuesday, God knows my heart. On Wednesday, uh, I'll get back to it next Sunday. <laughs> By Thursday, we don't even know if you saved or not. Friday, oh. And then Saturday, you start preparing to get ready to be holy again on Sunday. Uh, but, 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 but this process of sanctification or making one holy can be simplified in three steps. If you're taking notes, I need you to break out your note-taking capability. If you need pen and something, just raise your hand because I need y'all to get this. I need y'all to get this. Pastor Joe, they need some help and make sure they got pens and note cards and amen. The process can be summed up in three simple steps. And the first step is the call. The call. And this call is what Paul calls the invitation of men by the gospel. It is calling people into the blessing of the heavenly kingdom. Literally, God summons or invites all people to receive the gift of salvation with all his blessing that goes along with it. He sets us apart from the world and our past sins, making us special for him and his purpose. Now, what's hard about this is that when people answer the call and they don't understand what they're answering, they may treat the call as common. And they may think that even though I answered the call to be set apart, and to be special and to receive this wonderful gift of salvation and all the blessing that comes with it of his eternal kingdom, I still want to live my life. And so God, you're putting all this on the table. You're giving me all of this blessing. You're offering me all of this, but that's good. But can I live for me a little longer? Can I get a couple of things before I really devote myself to you? It's like a, 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 those husbands that on their bachelor night, it's not just a celebration. It's a... Uh, it's a it's it's a it's a whole occasion because this is my last night to do this so you see in in the movies we'll say the movies we won't talk about anybody we'll just say in in the movies they go to the strip clubs and they go turn up and whoo this is my last night of freedom people want their last years of freedom when it comes to Christ. Well, since I'm going to be with you for eternity, can I get about 10 years to do what I want? 
and then I'll serve you all the way, God. I will give you all of me. <laughs> I, I, I'll give you all of me after I, I've tried some things and after I, I, I've gotten to, you know, uh, indulge in a few things, after I've gotten to see if it's really as bad as what people say it is. Uh, And, and, and he calls us. First Corinthians chapter one, verse two. You put that up there for me. Oh, she's on it. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified, everybody shout sanctified. This is holy or Hagi, hagos, hagios, hagios. And this is number 40 in your strongs. This is hagios, holy, set apart, special. So to the church, the called out ones, ecclesia, ecclesia, the called out ones of God, which is in Corinth, to those who are special in Christ, Jesus invited to be holy ones, saints, ah, with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. And so this is to the called. The church is the called. The root word to the term ecclesia is kaleo and kaleis, which is 28, 21, which means to be summoned or called out to come together. God calls you out of the world into relationship with him. Let me say that again. God calls you out of the world into relationship with him. Let me say it one more time. God calls you out of the world into relationship with him because you are called according to his purpose. Once we grab a hold of that and we align our life to that, we will see our walk with God take leaps. As long as we have answered the call but refuse to follow his purpose, then how are all things working together for your good? Why do I expect the good, but I don't want to follow his purpose? Yo. Why do I expect the good, but I don't want to devote myself to him? I want the marriage and all the benefits, but I want to be able to step out when I want to. I want her to have my last name, but I want to be able to do whatever I want to do when I want to do it and still be able to come home and she be waiting for me. Everybody says, mm, but that's the way we do God. God, God, God I, I, I want all of your blessing, but I want to be able to step out on you and do whatever I want to do and then come back and you still hear me. You, you still bless me. You, you, you still there waiting on me while I go and do whatever I want to do. Ephesians chapter four. If he, if he's, Ephesians chapter four, verses one through six. Right, y'all taking notes? Make sure you're writing all these down. Ephesians chapter four, verses one through six. Therefore, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore, the doulos, the doulos, the servant, willingly I serve the Lord Jesus Christ, beseech you, beg you, plead with you, 
admonish you, cry and call out to you to walk worthy of the calling, walk worthy of the invitation to participate and enjoy all of the blessing of God's heavenly kingdom. To receive the gift of salvation and everything that comes with it. To walk worthy of that. To walk worthy of that. Why is the gift so much better than how we treat it? What if we treated the gift as precious as it really is, Willie? I said, man, this, I, I was dying and desperate and I needed a drink of water. And we just, but, but, but he says, walk worthy of it. Treat it like it has value to you. There, 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 there are churchgoers and then there are Christians. Churchgoers can infiltrate the called out ones without actually devoting themselves to the one who called them out. They can have a form, Pastor TC, of godliness, yet denying the power, ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. They can sit amongst the call and still not answer the call. That's why Jesus said it this way, y'all, that the wheat and the tear are going to grow up together. See, you, you have to decide, are you going to actually answer the call or are you just going to sit among the called? Many years ago, I had to make that decision for myself that I'm not going to just be among the call. I'm going to answer this call. I'm not just going to hear the word going forth and not respond to it. I'm going to respond by saying, yes. And so he says, walk worthy of the call, walk worthy of the calling in which you were called with all lowliness, which is humility and gentleness, which is power reserved with long suffering, which is divinely imparted patience, bearing with one another in agape. That's the term agape 20 six in your strongs, which means a love that comes out of the call. It actually is birthed out of your worship of God. That's why you love one another because you've answered the call and that call influences how you live. Yeah. Bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the saints, of the spirit, sorry, in the bond of peace, of wholeness. Keep it going. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in hope of one calling. <laughs> you were called in one hope of your calling. One hope of your call. The invite is for one reason and one reason only. Let me put it that way. And it is to participate and enjoy the kingdom of God and all of its blessing and salvation that goes along with it. 
He says there's one Lord, one faith, one pistis. Faith is a divine persuasion. So one persuasion, I'm persuaded by one, not many. One baptism, one God, one father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And so step one is answering the call. Step two is God then cleanses you after he calls you. He cleanses you. He makes you pure and clean, removing all the admixture, the intermingling filth through the blood of Jesus Christ by forgiving our sins. Now, listen, this is in relation to holiness. This cleansing is in relation to holiness. And so because he's setting you apart, he's got to pull you up and out of everything that you're into. You know, you know, men don't do this very well. And sometimes it frustrates us to watch our wives do this. But my wife, before she washes the clothes, she separates them. She sorts them into the proper piles and categories. Because to cleanse something, you've got to first separate it. You can't, you can't truly cleanse it if it's all lumped together. You're going to have to separate it out. Oh, God. So that you can wash each thing in the right temperature. And for the right amount of time and on the right setting. Oh, man. You can't just throw it all in there. I'm teaching, teaching the, the, the men for you, ladies. I'm just getting them right, getting them right. You don't put darks with the light. You got to separate them. Come on. Let me, let me move on. <laughs> so, so removing the admixture or the intermingling filth, he removes it through the blood of Christ by forgiving our sins, forgiveness. Eight, eight, five, nine, and you're strong. Alpheus or Alpheum to send away or to send something away, to release something from obligation or debt. Go to first, uh, go to Colossians chapter one, verses 13 and 14. And we're going to see his ability to set us apart through forgiveness. Verse 13, Colossians chapter one, verse 13 and 14 says, he has delivered us. That is, he has saved us. He has rescued us. He has set us free. Oh, y'all don't understand that. He has delivered us. He has set us free. He has saved us from the power of darkness, the might and the strength of darkness, and conveyed us into the kingdom, which is the dominion, which is the power and the authority. This is where God rules and reigns of, his, of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, the removal of all of our debts, and we have been released from the obligation of those debts. Oh, God. That when he saves you, you don't owe nobody nothing.
People want to keep you held to the standard of your old life. And you've got to understand that you can stay there. But I have been delivered from that. Hmm. First Corinthians chapter six, verses nine through 11. Here we go. They come for me whenever I quote this scripture. They start typing in stuff on YouTube and messing with me, but I don't care. First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine through 11. You do not know, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Uh, do not be deceived, tricked, fooled, hoodwinked, bamboozled, run them up. <laughs> Neither fornicators, which is pornania, all types of sexual immorality, Mm -hmm. nor idolaters, which is worshipers of idols and false gods who are spiritual adulterers, nor adulterers, which are people who step out on their marriages, nor homosexuals, which this term is actually effeminate, which is men who act feminine, nor sodomites, which is the actual term of men with men and little boys. I'm sorry. I'm glad she took the kids in the other room. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards or revilers, which is partiers. People who turn up and party, nor extortioners. People who force other people to do what they want by means of, uh, of extortion or influence. None of these people will inherit the kingdom of God, such as were some of you. But you were washed. Wait a minute, let me, let me break that down. You were made pure or clean the intermingling filth was removed from you. But you were sanctified. <laughs> you were set, a, set apart and made special unto the Lord. This brand of sanctification brings his gift of holiness so that believers can fully enjoy their eternal life now and in the hereafter. This specific holiness is the process of hagimos. And so he is setting you apart and giving you the gift of sanctification. Because the gift of sanctification comes with salvation. But you were justified, which you were made right in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. So there's the call. And then there is the cleansing. Let me give you one more for the cleansing. I, I, I had a good time with the cleansing. Titus chapter three, verses three through five. And, and, and what I'm showing you is that this is what you should be looking at. I once was in the world and now I'm out of the world. This was who I was and this is now who I am. Here it is. Titus chapter three, verses three through five. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, Serving various lusts and pleasures. Come on, man, that, 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 that was me. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> Living in malice. Now, we, 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 we messed with that word malice the other night. And this word malice literally means to be evil-minded, to be suspicious of other, other people because you're doing wrong too. So you think everybody's wrong because you're wrong. And envy, which is 
the pursuit of more beyond what God eternally thinks is necessary. That you just want more and more and more. Hateful and hating. <laughs> you are hateful and hating. Wait a minute. You were hateful and you were hating. So you were hated and you were a hater. Of others. Everybody shout, but. But when the kindness ah, and the love of God, our Savior towards man, appeared. Listen, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing. There it is again. Let me, let, me, let me break that down again. Through the removal of the intermingling filth. I just like saying that. <laughs> I just, that just sounds good. The removal of the intermingling filth, the admixture, the stuff that don't belong there. He removed it. Ah. And the regeneration, which is the new life, which means that you have been born again. That's literally what regeneration is. And the renewing, wait a minute. He washed, regenerated, and renewed us. And this came all through the presence of the Holy Spirit. So there's a call, there's a cleansing, but then there's the change. Y'all ready for the change? This thirdly, the change, he changes us into his own likeness through his son, Jesus Christ. We saw that, that that's his goal. That's his purpose is that we've been conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. This change, 3339, metamorpho, metamorpho, the root word for our term metamorphosis. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It literally means to change after being with. Changing form and keeping the inner reality to transform after being with. Being with who? Being with Jesus. That once you come into relationship with Jesus, there should be a change. Ah, no, I've been changed. <laughs> Y'all don't know. Because you're still acting like the old you. You don't fight with it enough. You give into it too often, which means that you have forgotten who you are. There are days where you don't remember who you are. <laughs> Brother Manny, that's why you can't look into the perfect law of liberty and look into that mirror and not do what you have read because it's like a man walking away and forgetting what he even looks like. So often because of our lack of obedience, we walk away from the word and forget who we are. And so we begin to act like who we used to be because that's all we know because that's the default setting. But if we do what the word says, then we'll be acting like who we are. Oh, man. <laughs> and so metamorpho, the root term for metamorphosis, we are transformed into the same image of the consummate excellence that shines in Christ, reproducing this image. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse 18, but we all with unveiled faces, <laughs> beholding as in a mirror, the glory, the doxa of the Lord. This word doxa is the absolute perfect inward or personal excellence of Christ, 1391. So we in a mirror, as in a mirror, we're beholding as in a mirror, the perfect and personal excellence of the Lord. 
his greatness is what we are seeing. And because we're seeing his greatness, we are being metamorphosed into the same image. This is the Imago Dei, the image of God, that we are being changed or metamorphosed into the image from one perfect personal experience with Christ to the next absolutely perfect inward personal excellent experience with Christ just as by the spirit of the Lord. In other words, you can't step into his greatness and not come out different. This is a picture earlier in the chapter of Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with the glow of the Lord on him, that because he spent that time with God, there was an actual uh, tangible, uh, 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 noticeable impression of God on his life. Do people see the actual noticeable impression of God on your life? That when they come into contact with you, they say, wow, man, you, you're different. Why you talk different? Why you walk different? Why you acting? You're just different. And you don't even notice it. Moses didn't know that his face was shining. Until they said something to him, Pastor Joe. <laughs> they were like, oh my. Like, what is going on here? And if that former glory diminished, how much greater is this glory, which is eternal? <laughs> that this glory is eternal because it's connected. Hmm to our eternal relationship with him. It's not focused on a mountain. It's not focused on commandments on tablets of stone. This is focused on the transforming power of Jesus. Ephesians chapter four, verse 22 through 24. I skipped that one on purpose. You got it, see with me. Uh, that you put off concerning the former conduct Put off concerning the former conduct, the old man, that old you, that former you, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. <laughs> and that you put on... Ladies, we talked about this, putting on the new man, which is created according to God in righteousness and the holiness. That's what you're putting on. This new man who is created according to God. Why, why, why does my life look different? Because I'm spending time in relationship with God, not because I'm trying not to cuss, not because I'm trying not to lust, not because I'm working overtime trying to manage my own sin. What I'm trying to tell y'all is that you just keep getting closer to God and your life will just keep changing. Stop trying to make it more complicated than what it really is. He calls you, he cleanses you, and then he changes you. He does it. All you do is keep yourself in position. You keep coming back for more. He doesn't expect you to go do it by yourself. So stop trying. Stop trying to be your own savior. First John chapter three, verses one through three says this, behold, what manner of love, ah, 
the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called, invited, <laughs> children of God. We have been invited to this. The Bible talks about us being adopted, that we once were outsiders. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm going to adopt you and I'm going to give you all the rights and privileges as if you were born in my house. Because I'm going to make you a joint heir with Christ Jesus. Ah. And so what matter, what behold, what manner of love is this? What kind of love is this that you would take somebody who was your enemy, who was a rebel and give him all the rights and privileges of being a child born in your house? Now think about that. Someone that was outside throwing rocks at your house, you invite him in and say, man, this house is yours. You're with us now. Everybody say, that's reckless. What, what kind of love is this? What species, what sort, what genome, what, what kind of thing is this that he would do this? Yes, that's different. And I need you to understand that he took you in and you were his enemy. That we should be called, invited called by name, children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Watch this. Once you come into relationship with him, you are no, no longer known by them. They're looking at you like, yeah, you ain't one of us no more. And you try to be. Let me smoke like y'all. Let me talk like y'all. Let me do, because I'm like, no, you're not. You, you're not like us anymore you've been changed you've got his hand all over you you living in that big house now <laughs> you separated from us now next verse come on behold now we are children of god and it is not yet been revealed what we shall be. This thing is so deep that we don't even know the fullness of it. We don't even understand who we really are and what we are going to be. <laughs> but we know that we are, we, we know that when he is revealed, which is Jesus, we shall be like him. Why? Because that's the purpose. That was the reason for you being called was to be conformed to his likeness. So we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. How is he? Absolutely perfect with personal excellence. Filled with glory and honor. And everyone who has this help purifies himself, Pastor Joe, just as he is pure. Purifies himself. He says, hold on, I'm going to separate myself because I know who I am. People won't separate themselves if they don't understand who they are. They'll keep acting like them and you're not like them anymore. As I said, from the top, we have a responsibility in this process that as we set ourselves apart, he then transforms us through his power, but we've got to set ourselves apart for him. There's a song, William McDowell saying, he said, I belong to you. He says, I've been captured by a love that I can't explain. He says, now you have me 
and my life is forever changed. He says, I've abandoned everything I've ever known. <laughs> now you have me and my life is not my own. I belong to you. How do I, 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 I toss and I turn and I pray and I pace and I say, God, how do I get people to understand who they are in Christ so they'll stop acting like they're not his? How do I get people? Sometimes I'm talking with people like, like, like how? How do we do it? How do we get them to recognize that you are no longer a part of this world? You are set apart for the king and his purpose. That as long as you keep going back to the purposes of the world, you are stepping out on Christ. Because you can't serve two masters you're gonna love one and hate the other and here's what that means for those that need to know exactly what that means that means that you're going to put one in a higher priority than the other because people will say well i never hate god but you'll put god second to what it is that you desire but if you put him first, then all of your desires become second. And then you fulfill what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 16, that if anyone desires to come after me, he must first deny, forget about, call, make himself of no account of, of just put himself to the side, pick up his cross and follow me. Because if anyone desires, to save his life, he'll lose it. And if anyone loses his life for my sake, Jesus said, you will find it. For what profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Close with this. Hagiosign, which is holiness, 42, is sanctification, which focuses on the Holy Spirit's influence of preparing the believer for eternity. The Holy Spirit is tasked with the job of preparing you for eternity. Let, let, let me get this to sink in. We think the Holy Spirit's job is to make us run and shout. The Holy Spirit's job is to make us prepared to see Jesus when that day comes. <laughs> His job is to walk with you and help you to know what is right and what is wrong what you should be doing and what you shouldn't. And the only way you can do that is walking in relationship, not in trying to make yourself not do this and that. Oh God. People say, well, how are you doing this? How, how, how do you walk with the Lord? I spend my time in his presence. Most people don't have time for God, so they don't have time for change. Okay, y'all didn't get that. Because we don't have time for God, we don't have time for change. Because you can't change without God. And so your job is to set aside the time to put yourself in position. To walk next to him. I have one over there. <laughs> your job is to make sure that you're in a position and a place where God can work on you.
I'm going to say this and I'm going to close. Stop looking for God to work on other people and look for God to work on you. You can't look in the mirror for somebody else. Stop getting in the mirror behind somebody else and looking in the mirror for them. You look in the mirror for you. We're stumbling and tripping over other people. And God is saying, I ain't told you to go and go in the mirror and critique their face. I told you to go in the mirror and look at my face to see if you line up with me. You're not going to change trying to change other people. You can only change by getting in God's presence for yourself. Opening up the word of God and studying it for yourself. Philippians 2.12, work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. Paul said, you obeyed when I was present and even now more in my absence, but work out. That's what the beginning of that verse is. Nobody ever quotes the beginning of that verse. And so my apologies for not doing it because it helps you to understand that Paul is talking to them and he's saying, I'm not there. I'm not standing over your shoulder. So even more that I'm not there, you ought to be working out your own. Husbands can't work out their wives' salvation, Pastor Joe. Wives can't work out their husbands, Sister Kelly. Moms can't work out their daughters. Sons can't work out their fathers. Every pot has to sit on its own bottom. <laughs> Sometimes I, I, I get old for some reason. I just... I don't know what happens to me. <laughs> I just go back in time. Every table has to sit on its own legs. Every person's got to stand on their own two feet before God. If you get in your mind that I've got to work this out between me and God, then people around you will be allowed to work theirs out between them and God. When you get there, you understand this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> you belong to God in a way that I don't think you really understand how precious you are to him and how much it pains him to see you go through Needless stuff. There are things that God is trying to navigate you through that for whatever reason you feel like I just gotta go my own way. And he's saying, No, just let me walk with you. I'll walk you right through the fire and you'll come out not smelling like smoke. You'll stand right in the face of the lion and he won't even attack you. <laughs> You'll stand on the other side of red seas and they'll part for you. There will be walls that seem like they're standing high against you that you can't get over and he will bring them down. But it takes you being in a place where I'm not trying to do this. I'm just trying to walk with you. And this is counterintuitive, which means that this doesn't make sense. I feel like I'm supposed to do this 
I'm supposed to go here, not stay with you. That extra time that you sacrifice to be with the Lord is going to be the time that helps you be prepared for that day. Because you don't know what's coming in your day. And you rush out of the house in the morning or in the evening or whatever it is that you're going off to work and you neglect walking with the Lord, spending that time in his glory and presence. And you wonder why throughout the night you're tempted to cut up and act a fool and engage in things that you're not supposed to be engaging in and get sucked in by the enemy. For the Bible says that God is faithful, that he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle, that in that temptation, he will provide for you a way out. What does it mean that he's faithful? It means that he is the one that you can put your faith in. <laughs> Not that he's just consistent, but he's worthy of your trust. He's worthy of your confidence in him. He's worthy that you can say, God, I'll trust you in this temptation that you'll provide a way out. That I won't just let my hands go to it. I'll give you a chance. Oh, God. How many people don't give God a chance? They just go into the situation and say, I'm here. I dare you to give him a chance. The phone will ring. There'll be a sound in the back. Somebody will step in and be the peacemaker for you. If you just give him a chance. Some of us act so quickly. And you know why we act so quickly? Because we don't know who we are. We're still thinking that we're whoever we once were, that we can't help ourselves, that we're carried away by various lusts and desires, that we have to go with it. You don't have to go with it. Can I declare that to you now? I'm going to say this in a way that's going to sound weird. Uh, but this is the way I this is the way I heard it. Because I hear people say this, and when they say it, they don't know what they're talking about. But what I'm getting ready to say is actually going to be it. I'm getting ready to prophesy to you that therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. That you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members to be instruments of unrighteousness, to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and that your members are instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Let me prophesy that, that to you again. Sin shall not have dominion over you you. I need there to be a pause in your spirit when you start going down the wrong road that you stop and give God a chance to redirect you. That you pause just for a moment and let him speak to you. You're on your way to make the call. You say, let me let God speak to me. You're reaching for it. Let me let God speak to me. Why? Because I'm his, I'm not mine. 
I can't just do whatever I want with this body. He saved me for his purpose. And if I love him and I'm called for his purpose, then all things are working together for my good. But if I'm rejecting the call and I refuse to love him, then that doesn't extend to me. It's not mine. You say, you can't say that. Don't say that to people. Why not? Why, why not? Why let you abuse God and call it grace? See, for me, I'm like Paul. I betrothed you to one husband. And that's Christ Jesus. And if I see you stepping out on him, I'm going to say something. I'm not going to be quiet. I'm not going to be like, hmm. I'm like, hey, that ain't your husband. Mind your business. I am. Bring it. I ain't never scared. Bring it. I know how much he loves you. Have you ever been in that situation where you see a person and you see how much this person loves them and you see them stepping out on them? Have you ever been? Y'all ain't never been there. So y'all don't know what it looks like. You don't know how angry that can make you. That you know that this person's wife is at home being faithful to him. You almost want to punch him in his face. Bro. You know how I many people wish they had that at home? You look up, you know her husband at home. Taking care of the kids. Chill, and she at the club, turning up. Messing with everybody. Up in everybody's face. Trying to figure out who she going home. You want to walk over and pour. What you doing? Go home. See, 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 we don't, we, see, we don't have that for God. Why, why, why don't we have that for God, Mama Hill? Why, why don't we, why don't we have that? Why don't we just look at people, step out on him and we just, mm. There ought to be a fire burning on the inside of you saying, man, do you know how good God has been to you? And you're going to. And if they recognize how good he's been, they're going to stop and say, what am I doing? What am I doing? I need help. I need prayer. I need somebody to help me not go on and act like nothing's wrong. See, as a person that don't, don't know that they've been washed, Pastor Joe, that they've been sanctified, that they have been saved, they don't know who they are. Sanctification is about understanding whose and who you are. You belong to God and you are his child and you must act that way. How do you act that way? By just going out. Stop trying to be good and just go after God. Stop trying to stop doing this and stop doing that and just find yourself more and more in his presence. And guess what? The taste of it will leave you. You'll notice when you're not like him. You'll feel it like, oh, what that, oh, God, forgive me. Why did I act like that? Why did I say that? And, 
And this is not to sound great. This is, this is all by the grace of God. I remember, and I'm still hurt by it. The last time I actually said a cuss word in the presence of other people, they didn't even notice that I said it, but I knew I said it. They didn't even miss a beat. And I was standing there like, did I just say that? Man, you gave me this mouth to preach your word. You gave me this tongue to glorify you. You gave me these words to teach and impart your knowledge. I can't do that. I said, fellas, I'm sorry. They were like, what you talking about, man? I, man, I saying some wild stuff just now. Uh, my apologies. Why did I apologize? Because I can't win them if I'm sinning with them. How am I gonna lead them anywhere if I'm living right where they are? <sighs> right where you are. Find somebody to link up with. You gotta slide down your row, you gotta move over. I want us to come together on this. Because this is not just for you individually, this is for us as a body. God is calling us as a people into sanctification, holiness, into purity. Amazon is now hiring seasonal warehouse jobs that are close to home. You got a mute button over there? <laughs> Amen. Amen. <sighs> yeah, connect with somebody. Connect with somebody. No, they're good. They're good. The two by two, two by two. Just group off. Join this group right here. Ambrosa. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Right there. Give me, give me some instructions. Right where you are, I want you to pray for the individual that you are sitting with or individuals that God, come on, Manny, get over there two by two with them. <laughs> Join in. You good? Listen, I want you to pray for the person you're partnered up with or the people you're partnered with. I want you to pray for them to know without a doubt who they are and whose they are. I want you to pray that they know that they belong to God and that they are his child. That they would have a witness in their spirit that that's who they are. That when they walk out of this door and nobody's around, it's in them. When they go to do something, don't nobody have to tell them anything that they feel it like, oh, I can't, I can't go there. Because we're getting ready to go into a season where God is going to be separating his people for his purpose. There are things that God is getting ready to want you to do. And in order for you to do it, you're going to have to separate yourself to him and let him consecrate you. Which means cleanse you and purify you. Remove the intermingled filth from you. So pray, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Grab hands, lock it, whatever you got to do, Father. Oh, God, we just thank you for this moment. And we're just praying for purity, praying for our hearts and our minds. We're praying, God, that we would set ourselves apart for your, your purpose and your glory. That, God, you would accept our repentance. For, God, you desire clean hands and a pure heart. God, you desire our full and wholehearted attention on you, God. Lord, we give ourselves to you. Those that are watching by Zoom and those that are watching on Facebook, we're praying for you right now to be pure and holy through your relationship with Christ. Don't try to be good. Just press into God's presence. Press into his word. Let him sanctify you. 
seal you, cover you in the name of Jesus. God, purify your people. Wash us clean, God. Make us whiter than snow. In the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we need you. We need you desperately, God. We want to be pure. We want to be holy. We want to be righteous. And we can't do it on our own. We can't do it by our own righteousness. But through the washing and the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, we can accomplish this goal. Lord, we working out our own soul salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is you that works in us both to will and to do what pleases you, God. We just need you more and more and more, more of you and less of us, more of you and less of us. Oh God, we give ourselves to you, our hands, our feet, our mind, our mouth. Lord, we give our bodies over to you as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable act of worship, God, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Lord, we pray right now as we mortify, as we kill our members on the earth, all the uncleanness, the filthy talking, God, the covetousness, the envy, the strife, the bitterness in our heart, and as we put on the new man, therefore being the elect of God, the holy and beloved, we put on tender mercies, loving kindness and long suffering. Lord, we forgive all that have hurt us, God, because we have been forgiven, God. And we put on the bond of perfection, which is love, God, letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly, God. Lord, we need you. We need you, God. We need you in this place, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. All I want, all I want. All I want is you. Can you imagine how that sounds to the Father? Yeah. yeah. When we say it. All I want is you. All I want is you. We live real in a quiet, nation that quiet, seems to want to turn its back on God, but there's a people who are crying out and saying, All I want is you. I'm not after the blessings, I'm not after the things, I'm after the presence of God. Because when you get God, you get everything else that you need. Yes. You can seek after things, but miss God. But if you seek after God, the things will come. All I want is you. 